certain kinds of life experiences to have a profound life-altering effect on me. Having an illness for 17 years has certainly been one of those life-changing experiences. But living in foreign countries has been another, only in a different way. In my book, Poisoned by Pollution, An Unexpected Spiritual Journey, I share what I've learned from my illness. Today I'd like to share with you one of those life lessons which has been on my mind lately as I go back and forth between the very different worlds of Seattle and Paris. My story concerns relationships and the difference between what I call Seattle time and Paris time. And by this, I certainly don't mean the nine hour time difference. At home in Seattle, I'm used to routinely making plans to see friends months in advance. We better get it on the calendar, we often say, meaning that if we don't plan a specific time and date, our best intentions might go astray and become lost in our jam-packed calendars. In Paris, if I were to try suggesting a get-together to friends a month in advance, I'd have a hard time getting anyone to commit. Hardly any of my social plans with friends here get made more than one week in advance, unless we're planning an out-of-town trip together. And actually, most of my social events don't get planned more than three days ahead. A friend and I might talk generally about going to an art show in a few weeks, but then we check in with each other several days beforehand to see how we feel about going and whether or not we need to adjust our plans. So in Paris, my week might start out with nothing on my social calendar, but by the end of the week, I may have had as many as five get-togethers with various friends, which came up at what we Seattleites might say is at the last minute. What I've begun to notice is that my Parisian friends tend not only to be more available, but they also tend to live more in the present moment. I've learned that being more present helps them be more focused on our conversation and ultimately to find more pleasure in being together. Being present allows for the two of us to connect with each other and know one another better. At home in Seattle, we tend to keep ourselves busier and more preoccupied with future plans which can make it more challenging to live in the present. Now that I've experienced Parisian style relationships, I notice little things I didn't before. For example, how when we're socializing at home in Seattle, people often start looking at their watches after an hour or so because they budgeted a certain amount of time and it's time to move on to the next thing on their schedule or list of things to do. Our style of socializing tends to be more one of let's catch up on what we've been doing lately and then I've got to run. All of this can lead to a feeling of running in and visiting with each other while we're double parked. But I believe there is another American tendency that affects our relationships as well. It is that we don't tend to make relationships a priority in the first place unless there's a crisis of some kind. For example, during the sickest years of my illness, my friends certainly made our relationship a priority. But in comparison, I spent much of my childhood living in Ghana, Egypt, India, and France. And in those cultures, relationships were a priority, no matter what. If you've seen my video, Taking Time to Eat the Flowers, Parisian Style, you know that I believe achievement tends to be our major priority in the U.S at the expense of other things. I've now come to believe there is a significant difference between relationships being important and them being a priority. Because when relationships are a priority, I make a commitment to them as more important than other things. And I have to make tough choices about how I spend my time. I now realize that when I consider relationships important but not a priority, I'm more likely to cram them in along with other things in my life so that everything ends up getting treated as equally important. It makes it more likely that I'll say such things to myself as, I'll just wake up earlier to squeeze more time in for relationships, or I'll make up for the lack of time spent with loved ones by making sure that the time we spend together is quality time. In the end, it leads to me visiting with others while I'm double parked. 
The Parisian attitude toward relationships as a priority affects my friendships here in other ways as well. My Parisian friends tend to want to see their friends and family more often than we Seattleites do. When we see each other, we tend to linger longer over coffee. When I leave Parisian friends a message, they're more likely to get back to me and to do it sooner. When we make plans to get together, they're more likely to express delight at the thought. During the intervals when we don't see each other, they want to be in touch more often. When I returned to Seattle after my first Paris stay, I was surprised by how often some French friends expected to hear from me. Even friends I had just met and people I didn't know well. Why haven't I heard from you, they would ask. A few even gently coached me because they were familiar with our American ways when it comes to relationships. We like to check in with each other, they would explain. I was delighted by this as well as surprised, because if I were to be this way at home, I would fear that I might be seen as too intense or perhaps even imposing a burden on others. But one of the sobering things I've also learned is that my relationships here in Paris take up a lot of time. I now believe it's pretty tough to make relationships a priority and keep a jam-packed schedule. We are only human after all. And no matter how rich or smart or efficient a person may be, there are only 24 hours in a day and we only have limited energy and focus. But I've learned another eye-opening thing. It is that not making relationships a priority may exact a steep price with higher levels of loneliness, stress, and feelings of emptiness. Mother Teresa, who worked with the poorest of the world's poor, once said that she thought that Americans suffer from a worse form of poverty than the people of India, and that is the poverty of loneliness. Our extreme American tendency toward achievement and the lack of importance placed on relationships may stem partly from our immigrant roots. Many of us are descended from immigrants who not very long ago threw out their families, relationships, and communities to come to the U.S with the hope of creating a better life. So perhaps it's not surprising that we tend to make bettering ourselves the priority. And yet I think we might need relationships more than we realize because most of the research on what makes people happy finds that strong relationships are one of the most powerful happiness tools. Some studies even find that it may lengthen one's life and even cut one's risk of depression. In the end, I've taken to the Parisian style of socializing and relationships like a duck to open water. I find that this way not only helps me to feel more joy and leads to fewer regrets, but it also feeds my soul and leads toward me feeling more fully alive. How would you like to learn more about what my illness has taught me? You'll find it in my book, Poisoned by Pollution, An Unexpected Spiritual Journey.